Welcome everyone to episode 10 of the DNA Papers, the podcast series through which we learn about the discovery and understanding of DNA through the primary research papers published about it. In this episode, we continue discussions of the follow-up to the key 1944 discovery that was discussed in episode 7. This discovery was that DNA is the molecule responsible for effecting bacterial transformation, specifically the bacterial species pneumococcus. Where last week we looked at the inspiration this discovery provided to an outsider biochemist to switch his research tracks completely in favor of DNA, in today's episode, we return to the laboratory where the discovery was made and look at the way in which the research group itself extended the work and consolidated the evidence that made DNA an important contender in genetics. This said, there are new players because the Avery lab was hardly static and new people joined and the original co-authors of the 1944 paper had moved on to other work. Both papers discussed today were first presented back-to-back at the 1951 Cold Spring Harbor Symposium Series, which that year was dedicated to the topic of genes and enzymes. Already we can see that if genes and enzymes is the topic and DNA is there, that there is a slow acceptance of the importance of DNA with respect to genes. The first paper by Harriet Efruzi Taylor explicitly discussed the implications of bacterial transformation for genetics and heredity, whereas the second paper by Roland Hotchkiss provided conclusive evidence that the ability of DNA to transform characters was not confined to transforming virulence via changing capsular antigens, but also by showing its ability to confer the property of antibiotic resistance to strains of pneumococcus that were otherwise sensitive to the antibiotic. The stories of how these scientists became members of the Avery lab and how they developed their particular research programs to bring them to this meeting is what the episode today is about. And without wasting any more time, I'd like to introduce our guests who will shed more light on these issues. First, I'm really excited to welcome a new guest to the series, philosopher of science, Eleonora Cresto, who joins us from Buenos Aires in Argentina, where she is a professor of philosophy at the National Council for Scientific and Technical Research of Argentina. What led Eleonora to DNA specifically were her interests in explanations and theory choice in science. And although DNA is not her reigning interest, she has published two papers that are arguably the freshest look at the question of how DNA gained the attention and became important among geneticists and molecular biologists that we have had in the past couple of decades. Thank you so much for joining us, Eleonora. I'm thrilled you were able to make it to the series. Thank you, Anija, for inviting me. It's really an honor for me to be here today. All our other guests are back from episode 8 and will pick up the threads of the DNA saga as it unwound in Avery's laboratory, all puns intended, and I'm delighted to welcome them back to the series. As the assistant to the president on special projects at Rockefeller University, just as it reached its 100th birthday, science writer Jeffrey Montgomery was involved in various activities leading up to its centennial that is the university's centennial, including interviews with some of the players in its historic achievements, especially those involved in the discovery of the importance of DNA as the transforming principle and the material of genes. Michel Morange, the renowned historian of molecular biology, is also back to lend his insights into the importance of understanding bacterial transformation in the history of the molecule at the heart and center of the subject. Jan Witkowski from the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories, home to the symposium series where both of today's papers were presented, was last heard at the conclusion of episode eight, reciting a poem 
delivered at a 1954 symposium by the second of our two authors, which among other things served as a to be continued in the DNA saga. So let us get to continuing that saga. Welcome everybody. And I'll begin with the usual question. First, what are these papers about? Could you please give a two sentence summary, one for each of the papers? Jeff, why don't you go first? Well, thank you for having me, Nirja. I'm going to give a couple more than two sentences, if that's okay. The Harry Frusi Taylor is really a review paper. She talks about her own work, but also what's happened in the five years since we talked about the 1946 McCarty Avery paper. So she was a PhD student in Columbia studying genetics when the 1944 paper was published, and she was so excited by the paper's genetic implications that she applied for and was accepted by Avery to come to his lab as his last postdoctoral fellow in 1946. And I think a taste of why Frucy Taylor was so excited by the 44th paper can be found in a couple sentences at the end of the first paragraph of this 1951 paper. And I quote, the discovery that the capsular transforming agent had the chemical nature of a deoxyribonucleic acid showed for the first time that a genetic function could be assigned to a particular kind of chemical substance whose properties were unfortunately almost unknown, but whose ubiquitous presence in chromosomes had been recognized for several decades. So classical geneticists who worked in higher organisms such as Drosophila had been able to map the relative locations of genes on chromosomes by isolating many different kinds of mutants that they used as genetic markers to track recombination mating experiments. And Afrusi Taylor and Roland Hotchkiss both understood that in order to really prove that the pneumococcal transformation process studied by the Avery lab was a process involving the direct transfer through DNA of genes from one bacterial cell to another, one needed to find additional mutants and genetic markers in, in addition to the specific capsule type tracked in the 1944 and 1946 Avery lab papers that we've talked about in previous episodes. So if Frucy Taylor's 1951 paper reviews the work of the last five years, her own work, the work of Robert Austrian and Colin McLeod, and the very important work involving penicillin and streptomycin-resistant mutants and genetic markers that's discovered by Roland Hotchkiss and talked about in his paper. And in her view, these studies decisively show that the DNA of pneumococcus bacteria must carry out many different genetic functions as it must if indeed DNA is the stuff genes are made of, not only in bacteria, but in higher organisms such as ourselves. Thank you. Eleonora, would you like to add something? Yes, let me echo what Jeff just said. This is a review paper, so she recalls previous findings regarding various kinds of transforming agents, the capsular agent, the so-called rough agent, an agent responsible for M protein formation, plus agents that account for transformation to antibiotic resistance. And all this prompts her to formulate two important questions. First, what is being transformed inside of the bacterium? And she takes transformation to consist of the replacement of the nucleic acid component of a cell element by an extraneous nucleic acid with a related structure and function. And second, she wonders what is the genetic nature of the inducing agent? And her answer is, well, they are independent genetic units. So it, it is really, the time was ripe for being a bit bolder about certain conjectures that were already on the table somehow, but not explicitly put in this way. Thank you. I would now like to ask Michelle and Jan to please do something similar for the Hotchkiss paper, which is titled The Transfer of Penicillin Resistance in Pneumococci by Deoxyribonucleate Derived from Resistant Cultures. Who would like to go first? I'll go first. I, in a way, to put this in context, as, as you've said, this was actually it was at the 1951 Cool Spring Harbor symposium on quantitative biology, it was actually called genes and mutations rather than genes and enzymes. And it's one of a, a remarkable series of symposia that began in 1941 with a symposium called Genes and Chromosomes. And it ended some 25 years later with the classic 1966 symposium 
on the genetic code. So that series of symposiums spread the whole range of the development of, of molecular genetics. And this symposium was the fourth in the series. And uh, as you said in your introduction, essentially all that, that Hotchkiss was intended to show was that another trait could be transmitted via transforming factor. And the uh, trait he chose was penicillin resistance. I'll quote him. The most important finding is that penicillin resistance and coat smoothness are indeed independently, inherit independently in our cells. So he, he took our cells, used extract from S smooth cells that were penicillin resistant. And what he found was the rate, the number of transformants was different for the penicillin trait and for the, for the smooth trait. And that was essentially all, all the paper was. He showed that the inheritance of penicillin was stable over, over generations. He showed that just as with the rough smooth transforming factor, the treatment with DNAs abolished penicillin effect. And he made the interesting observation that he could simply lyse cells. He could lyse smooth cells in the presence of rough cells. And just the lysate of those cells would induce transformation. And he makes a speculation at the end of this paper about whether this actually might occur in the environment as a means of gene transfer between bacteria. Thank you. Michelle, do you have anything to add to that or put a slightly different spin to that? I think John was quite right to insist on the Cold Spring Arbor meeting because the fact that these two papers we are discussing today were prepared and published after for this meeting is very important. It shows clearly that transformation was now recognized as a genetic phenomenon. And it's very, very important. It's important also because now the links exist with the community of people working on the genetics of microorganisms. The second point on this article about penicillin resistance is that I think West we must remember during these years penicillin was clearly something very important, very significant at the end of the Second World War. And to add penicillin resistance to the other factor genes that can be transmitted during transformation was probably important because of the fame surrounding penicillin. And something additional that I think interesting, even for now, is that we see that penicillin resistance and resistance to antibiotics is not a new phenomenon, but it was already known a few years after the use of penicillin. And it shows that lessons of the past require a lot of time to be received and accepted. So Michelle just made the very important point that penicillin, which emerged during the Second World War, there was a recognition that bacteria could develop resistance to penicillin, obviously a very important topic today. The other question is, between 1946 and 1951, so the last Cold Spring Harbor Symposium in which pneumococcus was presented, bacterial genetics had emerged. And there were mechanisms for finding nutritional mutants, for instance, in E. coli, that were not available in pneumococcus. So this was a very powerful technique to select for mutants that was deployed by Hotchkiss. And I wondered whether someone would like to talk about this change in bacterial genetics that occurred between the earlier Avery work that we talked about and the present state of knowledge in 1951. Michelle? Maybe to answer your question, I can give some important dates precisely for the creation of these genetics of microorganisms. In 1943, just immediately before the famous article of Avery, it was a discovery that there are mut mutations, or at least alterations of some factors in bacteria which are involved in the resistance to bacteriophages by Luria and Delbruck. 
1946, there was this famous experiment of Tatum and Lederberg showing that it was possible, as you mentioned, to transfer some genetic factors between bacteria. So it showed that there were some genes or something like genes which were possible to transfer and that this process, which was called later conjugation, was in fact a kind of genetic exchange. And in 1950 was also discovered generalized possibility of transfer of gene to viruses by Lederberg and others, and Norbert Zinder, for instance. So important discoveries. And in the background, I think, there was also the modern synthesis of evolution, which was really becoming an important, very important topic, even in uh, biochemistry and young, very young molecular biology. And it was important because it was requiring a unification of organism, the same principles, the same functions within different organisms. And so since higher organisms have genes, it was obvious that microorganisms had genes also. So I think all these events somehow participated probably to this acceptance of this phenomenon observed in bacteria within the general frame of genetics. So Eleonora, I wanted to ask, you have these two wonderful papers that Nirja referenced in the introduction, In Search of the Best Explanation about the Nature of the Gene, Avery on Pneumococcal Transformation, and then How DNA Became an Important Molecule, Controversies at the Origins of Molecular Biology. And that mainly discusses the 1944 paper and the context in which that was received. Can you talk about your own experience reading these later papers and how were you struck by the difference in the way they were discussing the problem and the process of transformation? I found the Bruce Taylor paper fascinating because you really see the, the slow building of a new conception of genetics from an epistemological and from a historical point of view. So this paper in which it moves forward for the first time, the number of working hypotheses that build bridges between DNA and genetics, I mean, in, the, in this sense, it seemed to me that it's a sort of turning point and that it explains, among other things, why we are discussing the paper here, why it deserves an episode in this podcast series. So, I mean, it was not the first time she wrote these ideas down, by the way. I mean, the first time was probably a couple of years before, I mean, her 1949 paper, Additive Effects of Certain Transforming Agents from Some Variants of Pneumococcus. There she deals with transformation from extreme rough to rough forms and vice versa, as well as with transformation to variants of type 3 smooth pneumococci. And she concludes, by the transformation study, it has been possible for the first time to determine that the mutated bacterium differs from its normal progenitor because of a spontaneous alteration which has occurred in a given entity possessing genetic activity. And these two papers really constitute a turning point. But her 1951 paper, which really presents some theoretical discussion and assessment of prior findings, is more mature, I think, in that it takes advantage not just of her own research on capsular transformation, but as you said a moment ago, but also on Austrian and McLeod's 1948 research and on Hotchkiss 1951 paper on transfer of penicillin resistance. And from an epistemological point of view, the, it is interesting how she generates certain hypotheses and how she comes to accept some others. I mean, we still find a cautious attitude here in the sense that she distinguishes quite clearly between hypothesis formation or what we would call context of discovery versus hypothesis acceptance. But she does a bit of the two, a bit of the two things. For example, when she formulates the two crucial questions that I mentioned at the beginning, I mean, what is being transformed inside of the bacterium? What is the genetic nature of the inducing agent? Her immediate answer is, well, as of today, we really don't know. 
So, but we can formulate hypotheses. <laughs> but then the hypotheses are bold enough. Oh, for example, she knows that we can have a two-step transformation. Rough pneumococci can be transformed into intermediate smooth ones, and then this be transformed to smooth ones. And from this, she conjectures the transforming principle replaces the DNA. And she conjectures that transforming agents are independent genetic units. So this is a very nice example of what in epistemological literature we would call a use of inference for the best explanation for the context of discovery. I mean, guided by different theoretical virtues, such as simplicity, unifying power, fertility. And, you know, some of them, they are mentioned explicitly in the paper. For example, when she defends that the mutated agent undergoes some kind of reorganization, well, the reason is, and I'm quoting here, that this is by far the simplest picture. I mean, and it is literally a picture in which the capsular agent is diagrammed, diagrammed as a rod. And it is a picture that leads to successful new predictions also. So this is very interesting by way of understanding how conjectures come up, guided by you know, a few theoretical constraints, such as unification power or simplicity or the possibility of having predictive power. But also some hypotheses were explicitly accepted. And that's a difference with the, with the original 44 paper and the, their sequels in 46. Michelle, in our discussion of the 1946 paper, called attention to the discussion, and this paper was written by McCarty, that the fact that you can pull the same, by all criteria that they could test, the same kind of DNA from an R cell that doesn't have a capsule as from a cell that has a capsule, and suggesting and gave the hypothesis that the DNA of a bacteria, of a pneumococcal cell, uh, performs, is concerned with innumerable other functions of the bacterial cell. So I wanted to ask Michelle about how these papers are really a follow-up of this hypothesis or a speculation which they firmly believed in. And, and in fact, that point is referred to, I think, in both the Hotchkiss and the Percy Taylor 1951 papers. Yes. Yes, Jeff, I think you are absolutely right. They are going in the direction of the 1946 paper because they show that it's possible to transmit different characters, very different characters, and also that the transmission of these different characters is independent. I, I have the feeling that they regretted in this paper that there were so few other examples of characters susceptible to transmitted in pneumococcus. So far, there were a few, a very short list, and there was still a limit, maybe, of the system of pneumococcus. Another limit was the problem of competence. The cells were not always competent for transformation, and that also was an experimental problem, making difficult reproducibility of experiments. And there was also the fact that it's, it was not unique, maybe. There was another example, but limited to some bacteria, and for instance, Escherichia coli, e. coli, which was shown by André Boivin to be also able to transform other bacteria of the same species. The results were not uh, reproduced by other teams, and since André Boivin died in 1949, it was difficult to know whether maybe the experimental condition was the same or not, what might have explained his success. So the situation was also somehow blocked in some sense with transformation. Transformation was now integrated into the general frame of genetic transfers, but the power of transformation remains also limited. Eleonora? Uh, 
So this is a bit of a follow-up. So in Frosty Taylor's 1951 paper, you find some conjectures, in particular some working hypotheses that build bridges between DNA and genetics, but also some acceptances. And the most important acceptance concerns precisely the fact that DNA is biologically and chemically heterogeneous. This is McCarthy and Avery's hypothesis as stated in 1946 in, in one of the sequels of the original paper. But we have, of course, a different background now. I mean, after recovering not just one, but six different transforming agents, well, this looks much more promising. So this is settled. That's my impression, as far as she is concerned, at least, not necessarily for everybody. And this illustrates quite well, I think, what's in the epistemological literature we call a use of an inference of the best explanation guided by various so-called theoretical virtues, such as simplicity or coherence with previous background. In general, different rival hypotheses cohere better with different backgrounds, but of course the background changes as well. So achieving coherence constitutes a sort of moving target until all pieces start to accommodate. Jan, you were talking about this incredible series of Cold Spring Harbor symposiums that really tracks the whole transition of genetics from its classical phase. They seem pretty uninterested in the chemical nature of chromosomes and genes from 1941 to 1966, where essentially most of the genetic code had been resolved. What was your impression? Have you looked at the, the context in which McCarty gave a paper in 1946 at the Cold Spring Harvest Symposium that I think that he admits was not particularly well received to these 1951 papers that occur within a plethora of, of major papers by Letterberg, by Hershey, by Norm Horowitz, who, of course, had been long associated with Beadle and Tatum. Well, what strikes me about this 1951 paper is it seems old-fashioned. The tools that are being used are the sort of classic tools of microbial genetics. Transduction, I was actually looking at the 1956 paper that Demritz did on tryptophan mutants and salmonella, where he uses phage transduction to minutely map the tryptophan locus. Uh, you mentioned the, the change into concerned about the chemical nature of the, the gene. I mean, that really occurred, I mean, the pivot point there was the 1953 symposium, where Jim Watson presented the DNA molecule. And now you, now you, had, a, now you had a chemical and it was clear it was the code in the sequence of the bases. And certainly at the lab, certainly in the symposium series, it moves away from genetic analysis to more chemical-based approaches. Actually, since Jan mentioned chemical approaches, I'd like to interject here and ask one of you to back up for a second and offer some background details about Roland Hotchkiss the author of the second paper in today's discussion, who was a chemist as it happened. Now, he's been mentioned before in previous episodes of the series, but I think there are yet some blanks to be filled. Jeff, I know you've already given us details about Harriet F. Cruzy Taylor in your great introduction to her paper, but as the person here who's had a few conversations with Hotchkiss about the DNA story at Rockefeller, could you please provide us some context about him as well? Who was he? How did he come to be part of the Avery lab and work on DNA? Well, I'll just speak a little bit about my understanding of how Hotchkiss became involved with the transformation work. I believe he got to Rockefeller between 1934 and 1936. And of course, Avery was famous for these so-called Red Seal records, which were these highly rehearsed accounts of the work that was going on in the lab. And so he heard about transformation and wanted to work on it. And Avery said it wasn't the right time. McLeod had been in the lab working on it and then walked away from the problem to actually do early work on sulfonamide antibiotics. And Hotchkiss went on with Rene DeBose, who was a member of Avery's lab, who then got his own lab and had done very important work on the capsular substance. So Hotchkiss was a trained chemist, and DuBose had discovered the so-called S3 enzyme, which specifically broke up the type 3 capsule. And that was a deliberate search to find an enzyme that would specifically degrade one type of capsule. It helped prove that the capsule was, in fact, 
the antigen, the primary antigen target for protective antibodies, which was actually the fundamental focus of the Avery lab, which before the DNA work had nothing to do with genetics. And that initiated a search, a sort of rational search for antibiotics. And they came up with this agent, gramicidin, Debosin and Hotchkiss, which unfortunately toxic when administered to animals, so did not become a general use antibiotic. But when McCarty left Avery's lab to take over his own lab on rheumatic fever at Rockefeller, Debose said to Hotchkiss, you know, Avery, he was called Professor Fess for short. Fess is all alone in there. Do you think you might want to go in and work with him and, and follow up this transformation process? And I believe that in the episode focusing on Shargaff, you talked about his early work, Shargaff style work, adapting paper chromatography to analyze the nucleotide content of DNA from different species and finding enough that, in fact, the ratios were different and the tetranucleotide hypothesis of Levine in which all DNA was the same could not be true. He found out that Shargaff was doing the same kind of work in a much more extensive way and reoriented his work towards this path of investigations that led to discovering these penicillin-resistant mutants. And he is the one, I should say, that really carried on this work for another 20 years or so at Rockefeller. Jan was properly saying that the pneumococcus work seems a little old-fashioned when you compare it, for instance, to the Demerit's work that was using transduction to find structure map genes in salmonella. And it was Hotchkiss and Julius Marmer, who later became a very important figure in the study of the chemical nature of DNA, that first showed that in 1954, that you could get two independent genetic markers, and that was streptomycin resistance and the ability to utilize mannitol as a nutrient that apparently occurred on the same DNA molecule. And it was a tour de force to demonstrate that, but it also shows pneumococcus is a cumbersome creature to perform genetic analysis on. Jan mentioned this excellent, in my view, speculation at the end of the 1951, Hotchkiss' 1951 paper, that the relationship between this transformation process that they're studying and natural events in the environment, pneumococcus could be passing genes to each other. And that was really defined in Hotchkiss's lab, beginning with Alexander Tomas, who's still at Rockefeller, showing the factors that are related to competence. Because in fact, pneumococcus, as we now know, has this whole machinery for taking in DNA from outside the cell into the cell and then recombining it with the chromosome. And Eleanor has already spoken about this. Uh, there are remarkably prescient comments about this, both in Afrusi Taylor's paper and in Hotchkiss's paper, kind of glimmerings of this knowledge that, of course, has now been molecularly analyzed in fine detail. So just the, the last point that Hotchkiss shares with Afrusi Taylor, all the previous scientists involved in Avery's lab with this transformation problem were medical scientists. They had MDs. Hotchkiss is a PhD trained as a chemist. Afrusi Taylor is a PhD trained in the zoology department at Columbia, but she was really a geneticist. Her mentor was Elsie uh, Dunn, who was a, a mouse geneticist, you know, well known for studying the so-called T locus in mice. Would anybody else like to follow up on that about Hotchkiss's background? I'll, I'll make a comment about the, uh, the paper itself. Uh, again, it's striking to me the, the style of the paper both in the experiments and in the writing. So he does very simple experiments, but draws strong conclusions from his experiments. And the style of the writing is, is, is sparse. Um, he doesn't waste words. He doesn't make idle speculations. And in fact, I guess when we, we come to talk about the Hershey experiments, Hershey had a very similar style to Hotchkiss. As regards the importance that Hotchkiss attached to this, these experiments, I'll just read from the introduction to the 51 paper, where he says these experiments on transformation still seem uniquely suited to elucidate the broader biochemical principles which implicate the nucleic acids 
in the genetic mechanisms of perhaps all forms of life. I mean, that, that's, that really is quite a strong statement. I mean, first of all, he's saying it's nucleic acids, and then he's saying it's for all, all forms of life. I think he should have finished, he should have ended the paper with that statement rather than putting it up front. But Jan, I think perhaps Hotchkiss thought or guessed that if he had done what you said and put the statement as a conclusion, it might have never made it past the editors. So instead, he hid it in plain sight, so to speak, earlier in the paper, in the hopes that if not then, future readers such as yourself and others would find it and realize its significance. And if I may raise another point here briefly about Hotchkiss's writing style, I think the sparseness of this 1951 paper actually speaks to his great versatility and adaptability as a writer. Because we know from his later retrospective papers on the history of DNA research, citations for which appear in the further reading list for this episode, that Hotchkiss could be incredibly eloquent when he chose and also quite playful, as evidenced by verse that he composed and recited on different occasions. I won't say much more at this point, but since this podcast is about papers, I thought it was an observation worth making. Maybe I wanted to contrast what you said about the article of Hotchkiss, very simple, very clear, and the article of Harriet F. Lucy Taylor. It's a very interesting paper, I don't mean otherwise, but it's not a simple paper. Hypotheses are quite complex, and it re reminded me somehow the paper of uh, Griffiths that we analyzed in another podcast. It's an important paper, but not a simple one. And maybe the, it's the opportunity to, to outline a figure that we have not talked about. It's a Boris Efrussi. So, as the name indicates, Harriet married Boris Efrussi in 1949. But uh, before she met Efrussi, Boris Efrussi in 1946, and she went in 1947, she left to France to work in the laboratory of Boris Efrussi in IBPC in Paris. Efrussi is a figure that is well known of historians working on this period because he has collaborated with George Biddle before the Second World War, trying to see what was the role of genes in the color of the eyes of Drosophila. It was a very difficult work. In fact, they did not succeed to isolate the chemical substance, but nevertheless, it was a very important work because, it, in fact, it led Biddle to choose a simpler system, Neurospora, where he did with John Biddle and Edward Tatum, they did that discovery on uh, the famous relation between genes and enzymes. So Efrissi was an active person in this field, but probably was not also a very simple mind. <laughs> he enjoyed complexity in organism. And I think probably there was, uh, you see the numerous discussions that might have occurred in Paris between Boris and Frissi and uh, Harriet Efrussi Taylor. And uh, you know that after Efrussi will be well known for uh, discovery of the genetic uh, presence of DNA within mitochondria, so genetics, cytoplasmic particles, and also on cell hybridization. So Efrussi was an important actor, but not maybe in the limelight because of this complexity, because of his recurrent change of topics, and also because in France you had another team which was very active, which was uh, with Jacob, Mono, and Wolf at the Pasteur Institute. And probably the, the second team was more in agreement with the Cartesian spirit uh, than was Boris Efrussi, who was of a Russian origin. So it's interesting from a cultural point of view to see the influence of Efrussi, 
but at the same time, the fact that is somehow in the background of what we discussed today. Yes, yeah, just to, to follow up on Boris Afrusi, in fact, in the 1949 paper, then Harriet Taylor, not yet married to, uh, it was uh, it was sent for publication in 1948, not yet married to, to Boris Afrusi. She thanks specifically, it is a pleasure to acknowledge the many helpful discussions of this work with Dr. O.T. Avery, Dr. McCarty, and Dr. R.D. Hotchkiss, and in preparation of the manuscript, the extensive discussions of the genetic aspects of the transformation phenomenon with Professor Boris Afrusi. So I think that it's clear that that, that colored this beyond Harriet Taylor's background studying genetics at Columbia and her interest in genetic that really colored this very strong emphasis on thinking about and exploring experimentally the genetic aspects of the transformation process. Nirja? So I know this point has come up before, but I'd like to get back to you, Eleonora, and ask you specifically to reiterate the importance of the Efruzi, Taylor, and Hotchkiss contributions in a lineup of seminal DNA papers. Why do they deserve an episode in this series? And how do they speak to the issue of how and or why DNA became an, or rather the important molecule in molecular biology and genetics? As I was saying, I, I think that there are very, I mean, two very different interesting things that are happening in, in this 51 paper. One interesting thing concerns the boldness to put into print conjectures that were somehow in the air but had not been printed before. But she is clear about the fact that they are just conjecture, they're just working hypotheses. But on the other hand, she also settles, I believe, some things that, and that has to do with the, of course, the fact that many work, in many interesting work occurred from 1944 to 1961. So, for example, the fact that there are two different transforming agents, much more than what we could have imagined in 1944. And that means that that makes McCarthy and Avery's hypothesis that DNA is biologically and chemically heterogeneous. I mean, well, that, that makes it pretty much settled by now. There should be no further doubt. I mean, many decades later, when Mirsky, Mirsky, for example, was asked about his reaction during these years, he would say, well, you know, given the context, you just had to wait. So, well, the question is, how much would you like to wait? I mean, <laughs> by, and I believe by 1951, it, it, I think it was clear that you, you didn't need to wait much longer. I mean, this is always also Hodgkiss' claim, I think, in a later retrospective article from the 1995. I mean, good scientific practice requires always a skeptical mind. You have the problems of the expert, which is that there are always alternatives to consider. I mean, that's, of course, fine. But at some point, the context make it more, you know, you have more payoff. <laughs> But higher payoff by accepting certain ideas and rather than just going on suspending judgment. And I think this is what's starting to happen by this year. And this makes it an, a nice uh, turning point. I mean, we have, of course, the important turning point in 1944, but this is a different turning point. There comes the time when certain things are starting to get settled. So. Of course, this means, I mean, the reason for this is, is that the background is pretty much different from what we have it in 1944. So I think this is a, an, another nice turning point and one more piece to the picture of the centrality of DNA for genetic considerations. That's what I take to be the relevance of, of this particular paper in this series of of papers that are being discussed in this podcast. 
Yes, I, I agree with Eleanor that the difference that one can consider the, the question that the transforming factor is DNA more or less settled by 1951, even though there's a question from Altenberg, Edward Altenberg, who was a very good friend and close colleague of the great Drosophila geneticist Herman Muller, where he's once again bringing in the idea that this could be the transforming factor. The DNA is somehow hiding some virus that is actually responsible for carrying the genes. And I think Afrusi Taylor, more effectively than any other rebuttal of the uh, there's protein or there's a virus, says that the hypothesis that this is pure DNA is based on the fact that treatments that denature proteins are subjecting them to the action of enzymes that break down proteins in no way diminish transforming activity, but it's completely and specifically destroyed by the enzyme we talked about in the 1946, the DNA, deoxyribonuclease, that McCarty purified, and we talked about in the 1946 paper, and that agents which inhibit this enzyme, so once you discovered that there's this enzyme that's specific for DNA, it allowed them to control, better control this transformation process, and that if you inhibit the action of this DNA, that protects the transforming activity. So even though it, it would seem retrospectively the issue is settled, it seems that it was not quite settled in people's minds. And I, I actually wanted to ask Michelle and Jan also if you'd like to comment on this. It's also true there's a famous Jan Letterberg paper in this 1951 Cold Spring Harbor Symposium that did a Zinder that is one of the no most notoriously complex papers in the history of genetics. And of course, Let Letterberg had discovered this genetic recombination in E. coli, but it was poorly understood at the time. And it was only clarified through the efforts, Michelle, of Jacob and Volman a few years later. And, and we don't need to go into that. But it is true that all these processes of gene transfer in E. coli and also in phage were not understood. Remember, Hershey Chase is not until the next year. So they still don't understand what, what is going in when a phage infects a bacterial cell, an E. coli cell, what's happening in that process. That is, they are not able to picture that. So I wondered if Michelle could just talk about the, and Jan, just about the general uncertainty during this period. It's, it's, a, it's not a period of, of great clarity, both in, in the pneumococcal work, they don't understand this, this process of transformation, which is a natural process that pneumococcal cells and quite many other bacterial species have evolved to spread their genes around to enable them to survive in, in difficult environmental circumstances has not been studied at all. Michelle, would you like to talk more about the period? Yes, I agree with you completely, Jeff. The question was not settled at that time. DNA was probably at the focus of attention of researchers, but what was missing was a clear description of DNA structure. Uh, it was probably an important molecule. With Shargaff, it was known that it was the composition in basis was varying from one species to another, but exactly what the gene is and what is structure long molecules, it was not obvious yet at that time. And in addition, the idea of what was missing was the idea of code, of a real linear correspondence between the succession of bases and the succession, for instance, of amino acid in proteins. And this will appear with discovery of the DNA structure in 1953, two years later, not very uh, long after, but nevertheless, it was crucially missing to really uh, say DNA is the molecule responsible. There was not this link, not yet, I think. You are absolutely right. So other hypotheses were proposed by many people trying to associate the two or to make a combination of or so on of uh, hypotheses, but the situation was not clear. Yes, I'd like to ask Jan to comment on this also, what Michelle was just talking about. The uncertainty about these gene transfer systems, both in pneumococcal and bacterial mating and in mixed infection and, and phage, but also 
the pre-A model for the three-dimensional structure of DNA, you see in both in the McCarty-Avery paper from 1946, and I believe in both of the Frucci Taylor and Hotchkiss papers, even when they they've rejected the tetranucleotide hypothesis and they're they're understanding that they're different DNAs and they're different ratios of the four nucleotides now known by the letters A, T, C, G. They think that the differences of DNA are three-dimensional structural differences. In other words, the DNA that's conferring penicillin resistance would have a different three-dimensional structure from the DNA that is conferring streptomycin resistance or this rough to extremely rough mutation that Eleanor spoke about, which, which was studied extensively by Harry at Bruce Teller, the acquisition of M protein trait that is studied by Austrian and McLeod that's referenced in the Bruce Taylor paper. So it, just as the proteins, different enzymes, the specific action of different enzymes, DNA or ribonuclease, would have been presumed to be based on the different three-dimensional structures of the proteins, DNAs and ribonucleus. They thought that DNA, the different genetic traits that are carried by transformation by the different DNA fractions, would have different three-dimensional structures. And it's only once you had a model and you saw the linear, that the, 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 even the idea of a code could come into being. Eleonora? Uh, yeah, just to follow up, I completely agree with what you and Michelle were saying. Just that, I mean, DNA, as far as Harriet Frucci Taylor is concerned, I mean, is biologically and chemically heterogeneous. That's it. I mean, that that was what she takes to be not everybody in the scientific community, but at least as far as she is concerned, it's settled. I mean, that, that that's that's all. But of course, she is very very honest about everything that she has no idea about, which is exactly how, well, every, everything that you have just said have to do with how this well, I think it's would worth, actually work. I think it's worth remembering that there was still a lot of confusion about what a gene was, not just chemically, but what a gene was as a concept. And there's the in that same 51 symposium, it's opened by Richard Goldschmidt, who in a paper that's notorious for his comparison of the gene to the strings on the violin, playing a violin string, because they were having to deal with all these peculiar position effects that, that were being found at, at that time. But Ed Lewis was at that same symposium presenting some of his work. And so in a way, it's not, it's not surprising that if, if they were still confused about a, a concept of the gene, sort of the move, the move to thinking about the gene as a, as a, as a chemical, I think must have been really quite a, a stretch. But coming up briefly to the point you were saying, Jeff, about uh, the very soon DNA was regarded as the, the, the chemical of the gene. And I think I mentioned this before in a 1954 symposium, Kenneth Cooper criticized Hotchkiss's paper on those very same grounds that there might still be a very active contaminant as part of the transforming factor that was not DNA and it was the, the transforming factor. And Hotchkiss, I think, made a rather nice point. He said, well, actually, of course, no one's proved that enzymes are proteins. There might be some very active little thing associated with the protein part of an enzyme that also gets carried along when it gets crystalline. And when the protein is denatured, this little thing, whatever it is, falls off and can't work as an enzyme anymore. I thought that was really quite a nice little riposte. If I could just follow on, Jen, when you were talking about the concise nature of the Hotchkiss paper, with the flourish at the beginning, that the transformation phenomena seems to point towards the broader biochemical principles which implicate nucleic acids and the genetic mechanisms of perhaps all forms of life. I was very intrigued. He found, Demerit had previously found in a different bacterial species, that acquisition of resistance to penicillin is, is a multi-step process. To become highly resistant to penicillin is a three-step process that you have to continuously select for that, and that that is paralleled by transformation. So you have to do one, one transformation to get modest penicillin resistance, 
another transformation to get medium penicillin resistance, and then still a third to get high level penicillin resistance. And he says, and this is connecting his work to the earlier work, pioneering work of Demeritz, who of course was the director of Cold Spring Harbor at the time this symposium was given in 1951, that this encourages a view that these transformations in pneumococcus have recapitulated the experience of the resistant donor strains and originally acquiring through stepwise spontaneous mutations their resistance to penicillin. And that triggered in my head a phrase from a famous lecture by Max Delbrook, physicist looks at biology, that if it be true, and I'm quoting from this 1949 lecture, if it be true that the essence of life is the accumulation of experience through the generations, then one may perhaps suspect that the key problem of biology from the physicist's point of view is how living matter manages to record and perpetuate its experiences. So we can see sort of latent, nascent, in this phrasing of Hotchkiss and, of course, in this old transformation work, that the acquisition of genetic experience through mutation and natural selection has now been connected to DNA, to the progressive acquisition of DNA. But as we've discussed, that doesn't really become clear until some years after 1951. Thank you, Jeff, both for your insights into today's paper and for stepping in so ably and taking over as moderator of today's session when technical glitches threw me off the air. Thank you also, Eleonora, Michelle, and Jan, for your very valuable contributions to today's discussion. This has been a podcast from the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. I am Neeraja Sankaran, the moderator for the series, and would like to invite you back next month when we move on to the next chapter in the history of the DNA papers.